<sighs> it's another return of a female love interest, but this time not nearly as interesting as Julie Gray. Hopefully the B-plot is more entertaining than I remember. The episode starts out strong enough, with JR catching Sue Ellen coming home late and inquiring about her whereabouts. With memories of Cliff's paternity suit nearly exposing her infidelities firmly in mind, JR is extra salty about her drawing attention to herself. Pamby are also having issues that could probably be solved with a conversation between two reasonable adults, but since there are none of those in the room, they just sulk. I should note what may be a very inside joke from the props department as Pamela reads the fictional book American Vision by William Russell. The book can also be seen as a prop in the classic David Jansen series The Fugitive. William Russell was the protagonist of the biting Gore Vidal satire The Best Man from 1964. The film is about two presidential candidates vying for the endorsement of the current president. One is Joe Cantwell, played by one-time Uncle Ben, Cliff Robertson, a ruthless and conniving politician. The other is William Russell, played by Henry Fonda, who, as far as I know, never played Uncle Ben, but who would have been absolutely perfect in that role. Russell is an idealist who is seen as too moral and upright to get down and dirty in politics. Now, the idea of an idealist and a hustler fighting over the approval of a father figure is already starting to sound relevant to our proceedings, but there is one other layer of nuance that's of particular import. This episode aired January 18th, 1980, but would have been shot a few months prior. On November 13th, 1979, Ronald Reagan announced his candidacy for the Republican nomination for President of the United States. Prior to his life in politics, Ronald Reagan was a so-so B-movie actor who tried several times to bust into the A-list roles. One audition in particular stands out as relevant to this episode. Ronald Reagan tried out for the role of idealist William Russell, and lost the role to Henry Fonda because... Wait for it. Ronald Reagan didn't look presidential enough. One year and two days after the airing of this episode, Ronald Reagan would be sworn in as the 40th president of the United States. And normally you could say he got the last laugh on Fonda, but Henry Fonda won an Academy Award for On Golden Pond that year, so I guess you could say they both did well for themselves. Ray and Donna are finishing off a nightcap. Donna wonders why she, a night person, ever got tangled up with a day person like Ray. Yeah, that's the reason it's puzzling you're together. Donna apologizes for all the sneaking around and promises that it won't be this way forever. Matt Devlin tries to snow Miss Ellie and the Daughters of the Alamo into supporting an initiative to tear down Mimosa Park and build an apartment complex for the homeless. But Miss Ellie points out that the target group for the apartments makes about $25,000 per year, or about $90,000 in 2022 money. Well, if there's any group that's going to be skeptical of coming in and setting up shop in a place that you're unwelcome, it's the Daughters of the Alamo. At the store, Harrison Page gushes over Pamela's great work. He likes it so much, he wants her to go to Paris. Well, that doesn't seem so bad. It's practically a day trip. Oh, that Paris. So Ellen and Dusty are still going hot and heavy. She marvels at how the Daughters of the Alamo used to be her entire life. But now she has Dusty and John Ross to complete her. So Ellen pulls the subtext right out into the open. She was content to be a trophy wife to a philandering husband as long as she was comfortable. But then she saw how Pam and Bobby had a happy, loving relationship, and she realized she should want more. This is a great monologue from Linda Gray. Of course, Dusty, perfect man, tells her that he'll support her in anything she wants to do. Despite his momentary attack of toxic masculinity, he just wants her to be happy. He also extends an open invitation to move in with him at San Angelo. Donna and Ray have a drink at the bar to discuss the foreign film that Donna dragged him to. They run into some of Ray's cowpoke friends and talk shop, which clearly makes Donna uncomfortable. Bobby gets super creepy saying if Pam wants to go to Paris, he'll be the one to take her. When she tells him it's only 48 hours and some breathing room might do them good. Well, if you really believe that, you're a fool. Dude, this is like the speech you give right before you have to start planning to hide the body. I can't live without you. And I won't let you live without me. Thankfully, he just storms out and Pamela has to make her, maybe I'm the unreasonable one face. I know I've been tallying the mounting evidence that Alan Beam is queer-coded. Masterstroke. But maybe it's time to start asking the question, is Bobby Ewing a serial killer? I'm just saying that a man left out there alone might not ever be heard from again. 
I mean, he was the roadman for Ewing Oil all those years, traveling from city to city. And it might help explain what happened to that dog from the first episode. Tensions start to boil over between Donna and Ray as they discover how little they have in common outside of sex. They sweep it under the rug like a good Dallas couple. For now. At breakfast, Lucy tells Pam that Cliff isn't returning any of Alan's calls. Pam tells her that Cliff will come around because the Barneses are resilient. Well, yeah, I mean, they'd have to be with all the losing that they do. Pam also admits she doesn't like Alan, but she's trying very hard to. Wait, when have those two ever interacted with one another? Miss Ellie starts in on real estate developers like Bobby didn't just have his own development business months earlier. Bobby mopes his way through breakfast with Pam, but he does offer some good advice on other people's relationships. As he tells Ray that as long as Donna likes him, that's all that matters. Kristen, who is still a person that exists, gets pissy because JR treats her like a secretary. Bobby sees Pam off in an icy but civil exchange and then runs right into Jenna Wade. You may remember her from such episodes as Old Acquaintance. Here she's played by Francine Tacker, who is a fine actress in other roles, but she's a boring substitute for Morgan Fairchild and Priscilla Presley. Of course, the reunion is the last thing Pam sees before getting on the plane. Bobby and Jenna catch up over drinks, where Jenna reveals that she and Pam occasionally bump into one another because Jenna is a fashion editor. At dinner, Donna and Dave get into a political debate over healthcare. During a break, Ray and Luann commiserate about their political romantic partners. Dave tells Donna he doesn't see Ray making her happy, but she sets him straight. Ray finally points out they don't have a whole lot in common. Donna asks him to stay, though, and find things that aren't cattle ranching, politics, or foreign movies. JR continues to blow off Kristen, suggesting that she get a lover to keep her occupied so she stops bothering him. In a brief moment of foreshadowing, Dusty says he's going to delay his flight back to San Angelo since he's the pilot after all. Sue Ellen returns home and tells JR he can't do anything to stop her. Well, now that's just tempting fate. Bobby and Jenna reminisce about old times, do an awful lot of kissing on the lips for platonic friends. At breakfast, JR implies that Bobby and Jenna are, um, renewing old acquaintances. He also vagina blocks Sue Ellen by offering to take her on a trip and then offering to escort her to the DOA rally when she says that she's busy. Funny bit is Sue Ellen openly wishes misery on JR. You ready, sugar? I hope you have a miserable time today. At a romantic picnic, Bobby and Jenna discuss what they want out of life. Jenna says she wants the same kind of marriage that he has with Pam. She circles back around to a discussion about their first kiss, which is some sneaky seduction technique. The DOA meeting goes well, thanks to Sue Ellen and Donna. JR sneaks in to point out that Donna is rich enough, beautiful enough, and charismatic enough to have the world. So why would she be happy with Ray? Of course it works, and Ray breaks up with Donna right after the event. Donna pleads with him not to listen to JR, especially since JR was just saying it to get revenge on her for siding with Cliff Barnes months ago. Her pleas don't work, though, and Ray walks out on her. And to cap off the episode, Bobby cheats on Pam. I know the episode's framing makes it feel like a cliffhanger because it's a will-they-won't-they-sleep-together thing, but all of the stuff he's done since the airport is pretty clearly cheating behavior. Hey, um, Mr. Real Estate Developer? Why don't you try developing some boundaries for appropriate relationships? Anyway, we're out. This episode started strong enough and then went downhill once Jenna Wade showed up. This isn't Francine Tacker's fault, although she is the weakest of the Jenna Wades. This is just silly decision after silly decision in writing Bobby Ewing. I mean, for God's sakes, his wife wasn't even on the plane yet, and he's already so lonely that he's hooking up with his ex-girlfriend? Okay, let's say Bobby isn't a fully grown human with the ability to resist temptation, and that Jenna Wade does have some sort of mystical hold over him. Then maybe knowing that, you don't put yourself in the position of being alone with her? I mean, Pam did it back in the first episode, but they were barely married, and his entire family made it known that they hated her. And it was part of a scheme! This is just Bobby getting upset that his wife will be gone for the duration of a Reggie Hammond furlough. What? Hammond. Anyway, this storyline will continue to infect the next episode, so more to come. The good part of the episode comes from the unlikeliest of sources, and that's Ray Krebs. I mock Ray a lot, but it has nothing to do with Steve Keneally's performance. It's just that Ray's kind of a dunce who slept with his underage niece, and that seems to be the extent of his character. 
Here we get a peek into something that will come to be a defining trait throughout most of the next few years. Ray's deep-seated feelings of inadequacy. He doesn't feel good enough for Donna. He doesn't feel good enough for Jock Ewing's legacy. He doesn't feel good enough for Donna again. It's a consistent pattern that makes him more interesting, if a bit whiny. We only got room for one angsty brother, Raymond. Other than that, there are some huge red flags being waved. Sue Ellen, for example, is just too happy. And while I like to see Sue Ellen smile, the show is fueled by her misery, so you know some shit's about to go down.